Hey, friendo, Steve here. And Larson. And welcome back to Going In Raw, the only pro wrestling podcast you need to be listening to right here at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Larson. It's SummerSlam Day, Larson. You're gonna be do, we're going to be doing a reaction live stream starting at what, 2 o'clock? Is that when the pre-show starts? Boy, show? how about that takeover last night? Wow, that was, wow. Oh, boy. That was something else. Hopefully everybody is okay. Because, you know, it'd be really insensitive if somebody got really hurt at TakeOver. Well, it hasn't happened yet. It's Wednesday we're shooting it's, We're shooting on Wednesday. We're shooting this on Wednesday. Yeah, so hopefully TakeOver was really good. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for our live stream last night. Yes. And, uh, yeah, uh, tonight we're we got back SummerSlam. We're at it today. Yeah, starting at 2, we'll go until the show ends. We'll do a recap uh, video right afterwards. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, good stuff. Be a long day. WWE really knows how to test our limits of fun. Got that right, <laughs> buddy. You got yeah. that right. Anyways, of course, this is the Matt Chat where we solicit our $20 a month and up friendos over on the Patreon uh, to send us some video questions, and then we answer those video questions and have some hopefully thrilling debates Oof. about professional wrestling. Yeah. So uh, who do we got up first, Larson? Uh, Jacksonville's number one. Gion Halili. Awesome. Let's see what Gion has to say. What's going on, friendos? This is Jacksonville's number one Matt Chatter, Gion Halili, back with another Matt Chat question. This week, my question is simple. Is the WWE hurting itself by relying too much on past superstars? I know the answer is yes, but I'd like a discussion from the both of you. Uh, just watching Monday Night Raw and they're just relying on Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels, Trish Stratus. So are they hurting themselves and not creating new superstars? Uh, just have a nice in-depth discussion. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Too sweet, hearty handshake. This has been Jacksonville's number one. Peace out, guys. Thank you, Gion. Larson, why don't you uh, buck the trend this time and you go oh, first yeah, you go because first. I know oh, this is a passionate. It really is. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm pretty tired of seeing uh, the old timers, the part timers, the legends in the wrestling ring. Uh, seemingly, WWE's philosophy now is, oh, we're in either a ratings or creative uh, rut. Uh, let's let's bring on the old timers, tickle people in their nostalgia bone, and get those numbers up, even if, if just for a week. Now, if if that translated into a, a, a long term improvement, I could see the benefit of it long term. If it was a situation where regularly and effectively these part timers, old timers, legends were in segments where the whole point of it was to get new talent over. And they can maintain that momentum again long term. I would see the point of it. Far too often, it's a band aid on a lo larger issue. Um, oh, we got USA is upset about ratings, which they should be. Um, let's have Raw reunion to have a one week bump in in ratings, only to go back to the the the, the average or the usual rating the following week. There's just no carryover with it. Ooh, I called it this week too. It's two point five. Yeah, it's low under two five. Low yeah. under two five. Um. That's really my issue with it. There's no there's no long term vision associated with anything at WWE, including their implementation of, uh, of of legends and old timers and part timers into their programming strategy, and it just feels like a trip down memory lane. Uh, at a certain point, at this point now, it does nothing for me because they're sacrificing time that they can be used to develop newer talent. Uh, create stars of that magnitude with people on the roster today. And I've said uh, countless times, in 10 years when all these part-timers, Taker, Brock, Cena, uh, uh, Triple H even, Goldberg, when they can't wrestle anymore, if this is going to be their philosophy going forward, who are they going to have on the roster now that could equal the, the magnitude of star power and, and satisfy that, that nostalgic itch that people have on the roster today. They haven't invested the time and energy to build stars up to that magnitude, so they can't do it. They just can't do it then. That's, that's, the, that, that's all good points. Um, I would take issue with a little bit of it, though. Uh, I don't think it's quite as dramatic as you sort of lay it out. I think that they do, they have in the past used. Now, okay, the, the, the one thing that you are completely and totally correct on is a couple things. Number one, the biggest thing is there is no long-term vision in WWE. That is blatantly obvious. The, the only long-term vision is we want Roman to be top guy. Yeah. And then it doesn't work because you need like a plan. You need like a yeah. And, 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 and yeah, they had a match between Roman and Taker, main event of Mania. Roman went over. 
but there was no real follow through past the next night on Raw. But okay, I, I agree with that. The sentiment getting Ro- having Roman go over Taker using the old guy for a, what should have been a pretty big notch in Roman's belt. And granted, they didn't take advantage of that nearly as much as they did take advantage of it. You have to admit, they got a ton of mileage. A ton of mileage out of Brock beating Taker Streak. That was one situation where you could take a look and be like, wow, they actually did. Yeah, yeah that was one really of the well with that. where they, they actually did, they took that and ran with it and actually did something with it. I think you can actually point to, and granted, I, I the long term thing is an issue. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, you can take a look at things like Kurt Angle putting both Baron Corbin and Drew McIntyre over. That actually did a that did quite a bit for Baron. That did quite a bit for Baron. That launched him into whether you like it or not the main event scene. I mean, did it do much for the company? Maybe not, but for that for Baron Corbin, he has actually been one of the better used characters in the WWE, and he's able to say that he. Be, it is true. It's true. Well, I'm, I, I would say, well, if if they were so attached to the character of Baron, then where has he been the last month? I agree. I'm just saying that for. Months on end, we saw a lot of Baron Corbin. We did, and, 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 and yeah, he was and in him, a very him beating spot. Kurt was huge for him, I'm sure. And, and again, there's a situation where they had an opportunity to to do something with it. Really didn't. Same with Drew. I, I think but he I destroyed think they, Kurt, and then he was a henchman. You say they didn't? I think they did. I mean, they did uh, after after that was WrestleMania. That was a huge moment for Baron Corbin. Yeah, and for like a month later, he was a main event in the pay per view. We haven't really seen him since. I know, dude. But look, he's a legitimate threat. He's not maybe to the universal title, but, but you to- can't say, look, you can't say that you cannot say that Baron Corbin hasn't vastly broken through whatever ceiling we saw for him two years ago. You can't say that well, he I, hasn't. I, 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 I won't dispute that point, but I won't chalk that up uh, to him beating Kurt. I think it was uh, there is no one week thing. by week. There's he's never one stuff. thing for anybody. However, I think the, 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 the biggest threat Corbin p- poses to the WB is uh, as a, 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 a viewer repellent, apparently. I mean, that could be. Um, you take a look at Trish Stratus. She's being brought in. That's yeah, going to be one pulling match. Yeah, over. But again, it's capitalizing on that win and, and pushing. I mean, I don't know how much further uh, Charlotte can go. I mean, she's already well established as, as at least in Vince's mind, the, the top women's roster. It's just it's one more notch on, on the belt. roster. Uh, they had a very compelling. And look, dude, how – okay. Let's 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 reverse this then. How many times has WWE ever since I'll say since because during the Hogan days they used to do tons of long term planning. Since then though, how often have they really been adept at long term booking? Like when have they actually gotten a lot of mileage out of getting somebody over? It's all notches on the belt. It's never one thing is a massive Actually, like is is a huge catalyst. I would I would argue that anytime someone has gotten massively over, it's been organic. It's been largely without the direct doing of creative. As in, you know, like Vince has said, "Oh, Roman, he's my guy. I'm gonna push him to the moon." Ninety percent of the time, post Hogan, that doesn't work. Yeah. Whereas you look at Cena, Daniel Bryan. Uh, anybody else who's gotten over into a massive degree, it's all been organic, mm-hmm. had nothing to do with whatever Vince's whims were, apparently. Um, so, I mean, you could say, yeah, it's been incremental stuff, but I think it's it's part of it is lightning in a bottle. It's, it's, yeah, it's sure. Someone's yeah. personality agree in that. with the whatever the cultural zeitgeist going on right now, mm-hmm. however that matches over. That's when you get crossover mainstream stars. They can't really be manufactured these days. So, And I agree with that. So when you bring in older guys... To get over the younger guys, yes, it's it's never it's never really oh wow well, like in the case of Brock Lesnar with the Undertaker that was that creative was actually lightning in a bottle. They did really well with they that. they did a good job of that. They did really well with that. Otherwise, it's just tradition in wrestling. You have an older person and you get the more you get the younger guy over. And WWE traditionally does that. You can look at more situations where they do that than they don't. This situation coming up with Goldberg, and that's I think why Gion is asking this question yeah. is because it's so blatant. And it's it's Goldberg's uh, uh, bid for redemption. Yeah, and that's fine. Whatever. I think that WWE does trade on spectacle as well, and that's the main reason Goldberg's coming in. He's not really a put somebody over guy. He's a guy they bring in for more eyeballs, for more subscribers, and uh, that's. I mean, honestly, they trade on spectacle. The biggest WrestleMania of all time is what Donald Trump one. I know the Donald Trump one. Did that do anything for anybody long term? No, but spectacle 
put all the eyes on that pay-per-view, that's basically how they've been able to become the most profitable they've ever yeah. been. But no, I just feel like these days when you have, I'll use this as evidence, and maybe it's not terribly strong, uh, our, our Raw recap. Goldberg returns. Sure. Uh, in relation to the TV, to previous two weeks, and granted, it's only like two days. It's only been up like a day and a half as of us recording this. Oh, you're talking about us anecdotally? Yeah, the, the numbers for that. Yeah, but our audience is kind of a reflection of like us, and yeah, we could kind of give a crap about Goldberg. I, I, I Do I care about Goldberg? I am interested in it as far as like a train wreck is involved. Yeah. Like, you know. But I understand your point about spectacle. Spectacle, spectacle has its, 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 its purpose. But I kind of feel like if over and over again you rely on spectacle and it's not generating any gains for the That's foreseeable what they've future. That's been doing. I understand. For literally ever. I understand. But back in the Trump days, ratings were already high and they were like in the fours and stuff. Yeah, but that was a different day. That was, exactly, that was exactly. But, but you have Raw Reunion where 90% of the segments were there to serve uh, the, the, the legends. Apart from Seth getting the rub from DX, did any current roster member actually get any decent amount of rub from that whole three-hour show? The Fiend putting on the Manable Claw okay. for two, Mankind. There's two instances, of course, apart uh, over the course of a three-hour show. So ratings, of course, everybody's like, oh, I want to see Stone Cold. And I want to see Stone Cold, too. Um, ratings were, relatively speaking, through the roof for that. But then the next week, there's zero carryover. There's not cr- Creatively, there's not enough in place for, uh, for the show for people to tune in because they want to see Goldberg or Stone Cold or whomever, the, whomever it might be, and then want to stick around week after week. Yeah, but dude, I'm, the thing is, if if it was such a dire situation, and like, look, yes, we've heard that USA is concerned about the ratings, but the bottom line is, and look, proof will, it'll, it'll, there'll be proof five years from now, but the bottom line is they're the most profitable they've ever been, and the bottom line in their business is kind of what matters. So Fox doesn't seem concerned. Yeah. USA does seem, I guess, concerned. Yeah. But I think... I don't know. They need. They. I think they need like a fresh coat of paint on the product. Also, I mean, if if Fox is investing in all these like fancy cameras and stuff, USA yeah. should probably be catching up with that. You would think so. Uh, but uh, it's. I mean, do they have a massive long? Do they have a massive problem building superstars right now? Oh yes. Yeah, we're getting that in the next. That is next absolutely two huge. Yes. Uh, but do they? Re- is it? Are they hurting themselves? Is if the question is, are they hurting themselves by relying too much on past superstars? I gotta say the answer is no. Their business is as good as it's ever been. It's better than it's ever been. I just pub- don't think they're hurting. Themselves. I think the public perception of them as a company by wrestling fans is not as is instantly match up with their their financial bottom line. Anyways, we got two questions next that are similar, so we'll run them back to back, answer them together. From Cult to False Realities and Christopher Rampersad. Take it away, gentlemen. What's good, Stephen Larson? It's your boy, The Cult of False Realities, and I am so happy to be back on Mad Chat. And since I'm back, I'm just going to keep this question short. No long details leading up to it. Just keep it plain and simple. My question is, why is it so hard for WWE to push all these great superstars and just pushing basically the same people over and over? Hopefully you guys got a great answer. Too sweet, hearty handshake, shoulder lean. Deuces. Oh, Steven Larson. So my question is, why is it that Vince is scared to develop new stars? Because if he's going to go back and f- get people from the Attitude Era or back in the 90s and 80s, how long can that formula work? And why is he scared of developing new stars? He have the wrestlers there who already have to build their name, but he haven't taken them to the next level. What do you think Vince should do, and why is Vince so stubborn? Thank you, Cult of False Realities, and thank you, Christopher Rampersad. Steve, go ahead. Uh, a lot of what we just said is sort of the the thing. Uh, why can't WWE push all their the superstars they have? Is Vince scared? I don't think Vince is scared. I think he's old. I think he's out of touch. I think that's clear. I think he's uh, too uh, willing to play it safe, although I'm not sure if I can really call ripping up a script moments before SmackDown goes uh, to air playing no, it safe. No, it seems, kind of seems like, like the opposite. opposite. Of that, yeah. <laughs> right. But just generally from a creative standpoint, it does feel like uh, he's not in tune with what people want to see now, um, creatively speaking. I mean, I don't know, man. It's, it, I don't know. I mean, on the other hand, he brought in Paul Heyman, who obviously does know what people want to see. Um, and Raw's been pretty decent lately. SmackDown's been kind of weird. Um, They've got this Roman Reigns. I don't know. I I I think that they've been they they just they've been playing it safe for a long time, uh, and it's just been all at Vince's whims. The, 
the uh, if you look at everything that isn't main roster, they've got including two hundred five live. They have they have some really really great creative minds in WWE. They just can't seem to reach Vince, um, and that's been the long term problem. You know, you talked earlier about uh, long term planning. You know, I can't think of of something more than uh, a, a better piece, a better example than uh, Becky Lynch, uh, who was really, really hot after her uh, uh, heel turn at SummerSlam last year. Uh, she was super hot. The crowd loved all that stuff. Uh, she main evented WrestleMania. The build to WrestleMania was whatever. Uh, she was she wasn't as hot as she should have been going into WrestleMania. Still, it had a big fight feel. I think. She comes out of that, did a whole lot of nothing. You and I are both on the same page with that. She should have come out of WrestleMania with everybody attacking her, yep. multiple targets on her. And I think she should have gone through several pay-per-views holding on to both of those titles until, I think I likened it to, I think I used this metaphor once before, when uh, somebody let all the inmates out of Arkham Asylum and yeah. then Batman had his back broken by yeah, Bane. Yeah, eventually she just gets too beat up and is worn out and someone... Uh, gets the best of her. And yeah. somebody it's breaks totally, her back. Totally how it should have been. That's how it should have been. So there is this element of not being able to capitalize on... Uh, on. They're horrible for the most part, capitalizing they, momentum. When they have something really, really good going yeah. on. The, the the only instance of late, and by that I mean the last year or so, where they've seen momentum, capitalized it, and actually been able to tell stories based on that is Kofi. Mm-hmm. Kofi had a ton of momentum. Leading up to Elimination Chamber, they capitalized on it, on it. They put the belt on him at Mania. And for the most part, none of the stories, uh, the feuds he's had since then, have been like mind-blowingly complex. They're all based on competition. They're all based on personality. And I think for them, and, and they're not showy, they're not flashy, but I think they're effective. And I think apart from his cage match against Dolph, the stories that have played out in the ring have complemented the stories that have been be, being told outside of the ring and it's propelled Kofi to be seen without question, I think, as a legitimate world champion. Yeah, but here's the thing, man. I don't know. I think a little bit of that is projecting on your part because you're a big fan of that. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Kofi, but I do think that if that was true, you would see a bigger spike in ratings to see him, for people to see him. Um, he's not on the cover of the game, and I think that the will of the people would have carried him to that point. You mentioned, you said there hasn't been a lot of flash there. I think wrestling sometimes needs that flash. Oh, it yeah, needs it that no, element of spectacle. That. And it, it's like we were talking about with SummerSlam. Um, the thing with Orton has been perfectly fine. It's been good. Yeah, I like it. Would that draw ratings? Probably not. Sometimes you need the flash, you need the spectacle. I understand that. So um, you mentioned a lot of it. It's creative ineptitude, I think, for a lot of it. Because you have, you have Becky, you have... Uh, Seth even all these instances of people were like okay they got a lot of momentum behind them how can we sustain build that momentum and apart from the Kofi example by and large fallen flat you have Seth winning the title at Mania the crowd's behind him who do you have his first feud with Drew no Mm -hmm. Samoa Joe no yeah with Baron who I like Baron fine he's got his I I understand his role I think he does his best to fill that role well he works his tail off I can tell he's improved be a supporting player yeah he's improved a ton a ton since his days in NXT he should not be in a featured role at this point in his career absolutely not because people just don't care they don't care to see him get beat up they just don't um and then Becky you have all this momentum and even if you don't do the storyline that we've talked about a thousand times the the Batman type thing Everybody should be gunning for Becky, and you shouldn't have her be feuding with someone who just came from NXT. That's true. Because people just don't care. They know Becky's going to win the feud because they don't even know who Lacey Evans is. She hasn't built up the equity with the fans to be seen as a credible threat. Um, with Seth, I mentioned Baron. Uh, he was interested, he's been interesting for about two weeks since he, after he won the Universal Championship, and that's when he's carrying the chair around with him. Otherwise, uh, they just kind of made him dorky. Yeah. And uh, just a little too generic. Like, isn't it funny? Usually it's like if somebody's personality is turned up to 10 or 10 turned up to like 12 or 11 or whatever, it's like, oh, man, that's really good. Yeah. Kind of feel like Seth's personality during that time when he was being sort of like. It was like a seven and a half. Aggressively dorky. No, I feel like that was Seth on oh, 11 or 12, and it's just not appealing. No, it's not. <laughs> I need, it's not I need him to be somebody wrestler. he's not. And then they, they forced Seth and Becky's 
real life and relationship out in front of cameras. And I don't want to see that. It turns, it, it, it's like, I really like Becky. I really like Seth. I don't want to see their real life relationship playing on TV. I don't want to see it. It, 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 I don't want to see that on TV because it's awkward. And it's awkward for them, I could tell, to have to do that. Um, it's definitely another, awkward for Becky. Yeah. yeah. Another thing. I think Seth liked it. Uh, he, I think he did to a degree. Uh, is indecision. Just in the last month from the build, the SummerSlam, we've seen several instances where storylines abruptly change course. It looked like we were going to get Roman and Joe at SummerSlam. And it was actually a pretty interesting little thing they were doing. And then suddenly a bunch of crap falls on Roman and we got a whodunit thing with two weeks to build to it. And it seemingly, uh, they realized uh, at two hours before the go-home show to SummerSlam and SmackDown that maybe the, we shouldn't reveal the attacker per, per se yet. Uh, maybe there should be some more investigation to take place and actually build the story so when the attacker is revealed, whether it's Rowan or Daniel Bryan or Buddy Murphy, whoever it is, people are like, oh, dang. And then there's actual heat to the feud. Uh, and then, like with Seth. So uh, Brock cashed in on him. And like two weeks later, he was ha-ha jokey doing a, you know, a, a Brock Lesnar impersonation on Raw. Totally not the appropriate reaction when someone just steals your title from you. Hey, you know what would be cooler if they did for SummerSlam? You know how there's been, there's been like sort of reports – uh, that uh, the that they're, they've been talking about Roman versus Buddy Murphy. Who knows? By now, maybe it's been announced. Yeah, Russell votes. Know. Russell votes uh, says about that. It'd be much today. cooler. So, like, it looked like they were heading towards Roman versus Joe. That's obvious. They had yeah. the Samoan Summit and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. And they did the thing. Uh, well, what if you did this instead? So instead, they they went with uh, turning Joe sort of face by you know not being a guy who's showing a, a bit of humanity. Right. Exactly. And then there are reports that it was going to be Roman and Joe versus uh, Daniel Bryan and Rome. Now it looks like that's all off the table. They're going to continue the storyline. Uh, what if the idea was, hey, we don't want to chump out Joe yet again. Yeah. Because we kind of like to make him like a bigger threat or a strong face. Uh, what if SummerSlam opens with Buddy Murphy attacking Roman Reigns like backstage, like viciously in retaliation for him making yeah, him yeah, yeah. confess, be a snitch? And Joe's the guy who then steps in, attacks Buddy Murphy, and demands a match with him to get back for attacking Roman Reigns. Yeah. And for, you know, being in the middle of this, you get Joe a win over Buddy Murphy. We like Buddy Murphy. Yeah. But you get Joe a win, he gets a win at SummerSlam. Yeah. And he's not a chump anymore. Yeah. See, that I'd rather see. Okay. Because Buddy Murphy versus Roman Reigns is kind of too obvious. Yeah, you Let's think get so. get Joe in there so Joe can have one match where he's not chumped out. That's what I like to see. Okay. Anyways. I kind of like to see Buddy Murphy win this first match, too. That's the issue. They get into Can't problems. have everything, man. I know. They get themselves in these positions. Sort of like when uh, the uh, uh, Asuka and Kyrie saying in their match this week. Like, Kyrie Sane's had one or two TV matches. Yeah. And then here she's taking the loss. It's a bummer. Yeah, it's terrible. It's a bummer. Yeah. But then Nikki Cross gets the championship. Yeah. Uh, so, more on the indecision. Going back to the Seth bit. Uh, so, uh, two weeks ago, Seth is absolutely destroyed by Brock. And this week he comes out and he's busted up. He's broken physically, mentally, spiritually. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, that's actually interesting, interesting direction as opposed to ha-ha, jokey Seth. Sure, I just lost my what he claims this week was the thing he loves most. And he's laughing, trying to crack wise about it. Just didn't seem to be an appropriate response to what had just happened to him. Yeah. But then again, <laughs> change course. Yeah, It's too, many often, too often it seems like, okay, here, we're setting something up. <laughs> Yeah, sharp course correction. They go veer back and forth, and how much of that is is stuff being rewritten day of? I think that see, I think that could be kind of creatively motivated, just because like, man, he got the oh, I know, totally. of a life. I understand why him being broken is it should be creatively motivated and was, but just this previous stuff, like, should you really be going out there and doing a really bad Brock Lesnar presentation? We just cashed in money in the bank on you. What should was, she be running around with a chair? What I was going to say was. Um, the, the bigger indecision thing would be, you know, Seth gets completely destroyed by Brock Lesnar. If he goes into SummerSlam and then loses, that's then we're back to Roman Reigns, you know, experiment territory. But with Seth Rollins. Yeah, I liked the, oh, next question. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's get into that next question. Patrick Sparks. Let's see what he has to say. Hey, friend of this Pat here. All right. So Seth versus Brock this weekend. Um, I don't really know how to feel about it. Uh, the build's been weird. Uh, yeah. I don't really think the fans are going to care if Seth wins and nobody wants Brock around anymore, so they're kind of in a pickle. 
if Seth wins, how good is his reign going to be, and are the fans actually going to care? And if he doesn't win, how much longer is Brock going to hold that title for, and who should he lose it to, if not Seth? Thanks, my nose. Bye. Thank you, B-Man. Thank you, B-Man. Uh, meh. I think right now, just the way things, I mean, if, if, if uh, how the crowd in Pittsburgh received Seth, Monday night is any indication. It's going to kind of be a meh if Seth wins. Um, I mean, there's a possibility that if, if Brock's – if this if this match is booked a la uh, Brock AJ, Brock Dana Bryan, Brock Finn, where they withstand Brock's uh, uh, immediate assault, uh, find a means to attack him to gain an advantage, and then unlike all those other examples, ekes out a win or finds a way to win, yeah, people might be into it, but I don't know if it's going to have the huge impact that – they might be hoping for because I think the build has been fairly rushed. I feel like there, we, there, there needs to be, there need to be like two more weeks of story beats for the crowd to really kind of get behind Seth as a true underdog face. I just don't feel like it's there right now. At least it isn't for me. So let's assume uh, they recognize that uh, they want to keep the belt on Brock. Cause they think Brock equals ratings. Um, how long will Brock have the belt? Probably till WrestleMania. And yeah, Roman Reigns will probably take it off him then. I, I'm not going to – I don't think I'm going to bet on Seth in, the, in our predictions. I'm not. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to either. However, I think that if the match is booked properly, um, if they give him a clean win as a damaged DDP rib tape sporting underdog – I think that I, I, I've, I've always been of the opinion that one match can change everything. One, like if you book a proper match, it can write a ship like immediately. Um, I think that's true. And I think that could be the case. Um, he would need for then the fans to care the next night on Raw and the week after that and the next pay-per-view and so on and so forth. They will need creative momentum. The odds of that happening previously have not been great with Paul Heyman at the helm. And I especially think because I think the last couple of weeks when he's been uh, leading things, I think they have been pretty good. I think with Paul Heyman at the helm, I think it's a good, I, th I think he's got a good chance. Um, that being said, I'm not going to bet on that happening. Um, how long would he have the belt? Uh, if, if they decide not to pull the trigger tomorrow, then that means Brock is holding that title through uh, the SmackDown on Fox. And if that's the case, uh, the Universal Championship might be a cross-brand title. If they, if they actually keep the roster split, that might be one that goes both brands. Uh, because Brock, I think everybody feels that Brock is a marquee name. Mm -hmm. I think Fox would probably be sort of salivating to get him under their marketing banner. Um, and so I think that would probably be the case. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to say. I, I don't know how long it would be. Um, mania is as good a bet as any. Um, but if ratings are really good and, and, and Fox executives think part of that is, is Brock Lesnar, they're probably going to keep it on Brock Lesnar in perpetuity. He'll be another Bruno baby. Uh, next up, uh, rich Nason. Let's see what he has to say. Hey, friendos, Rich the Smash Brother here with another epic Mad Chat question this week as I stand by my wall of pops that you boys have seen in the past. Yes, Larson, it is an entire wall, as you commented on. The Chris Jericho one you'll be sending me will be joining it as well. But I have a special guest today who has a Mad Chat question related to The Rock quietly retiring. But this gentleman, we don't think he's going to do it quietly. So, hi, hey, Steven Larson. I am the game, Triple H. When do you think I'm going to officially retire now that I am 50 years old? And who do you think my final opponent should be? Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Uh, before I launch into my answer, have we seen AJ Styles versus Triple H before? Don't believe so. I don't think we have. Uh, it would be Seth, but Seth has already had Triple H matches. So I would say he'll probably retire. i just take a guess, like two more Manias. And then he'll probably have like a retirement match. Um, and I would think that if it's going to be anybody, it's going to be AJ Styles. Another guy that he can sort of pass the torch to, but they're not so young that the guy's going to mess it up. Uh, AJ Styles, 
He's probably going to be retiring himself within five years or so. Yeah, he says his contract's his last one. Yeah, so I would think that he's a decent guy who's already up there that Triple H can you know pass the torch to him because he's already done so much. And if you pass the torch to somebody, you really want to make sure that that person is quality. So I was thinking AJ Styles, maybe even Finn Balor, if they can get Finn a little bit more over. Um, oh, it's definitely going to be one of Triple H's guys. It's definitely going to be a Triple H. So that's what I was thinking. I was like, AJ, Finn, Kevin Owens. Those are the three names that sort of pop up in my head. Well, I had th- thought of Finn, Owens, and shoots. Oh, Ricochet. Yeah, I thought about He's Ricochet too. H guy, but in the end, I went with Adam Cole. Oh, wow. Um, I could see Triple H seeing a, a bit of himself in Adam Cole. Yeah. Um, Undisputed Era, man. They're draped in gold now, Larson. Can you believe it? After what we saw at TakeOver? I can't. I hope, wow. God, I Shocking. Hope, hope that's the um, case. Adam Cole, uh, I, I I think he's one of those guys who's young. I think he just turned thirty, Jeez, but yeah. he's got a wealth of experience. In, in in based on his work, all right, I'm pretty confident you give him something, he can make it work. Sure, uh, you give him the rub of being the guy who retired Triple H. Oh yeah, that's right. He's been. Could you imagine if they did that retirement match at a takeover? That'd be awesome. Ooh, um, that'd be pretty huge for Adam Cole. Yeah, it'd be big. Massive. Big so I think that I understand your point about AJ, but if, say, in two years, they say, okay, AJ, you're going to be the one that retires, Triple H, AJ benefits from that for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and then he's gone too. Give it to somebody who's got a long career ahead yeah, of him. But I mean, even 10 years from now, it'd be like, oh, yeah, don't, don't forget, I'm the man who retired Triple H, who, out, who, who, who uh, outplayed the game at the game. Yeah. Yeah. And be Baron Corbin. Yeah, probably. Someone tells me Baron Corbin's a Triple H guy. I think he is. I don't man. know, man. I think he is. I don't know. I don't know if he is. I don't know. Uh, uh, next, we've got a question from Tanner. Hey, friendos. My Matt Chat question this week is with blood in matches, more specifically in the women's division matches. Now, do you think this is something that um, should stay its ground at, like it is right now and stay clear of that division? Or is that something that you could see if used properly and sparingly could really increase the drama in specific matches. And if so, what would be a match you would like to see that in that could um, increase the story of that, whether it be in the main roster or NXT? Thanks, friendos. Thank you, Tanner. Uh, Oh, I go first. Um, Like blood in any match, I don't mind it so long as it's used at the right time and it's used sparingly. If you do it too much, it's not going to be as effective. You know why the, the blood at the end of Triple Mania was so effective? Because there was so much of it. Also because we didn't see blood any other time during the rest of the show. That's true. But there was so much there was of a it. Ton. That was really the thing. It was There was just so it much It might have been it. too much. Um, so I don't mind, regardless of the division, the type of match, who's in the match, uh, I don't mind blood being involved as long as it advances the story and isn't overused. Um, so yeah, blood and women's matches, sure. Um, as far as feuds or matches we've seen where the, the, some, some bloodletting could have enhanced the story, um, I always thought the Charlotte and Sasha and Hell in the Cell, if they just let them do a little bit more, because that was her blow-off, I believe. It was, yeah. To really hammer home what, how impressive that feud was, whether it meant letting him bleed. I'm not suggesting, I don't really think that anybody should be jumping off the cell anymore, but utilizing the cell a lot more than what they did I thought it would have really amped up the drama of the match. Um, so I think that's one match that, that probably could have benefited from someone getting busted open. The highest profile match in women's history this past year's WrestleMania. Could you imagine that main event? If everybody was just, everybody was just gushing blood just everywhere. Open. That'd be awesome. That could have been great. Yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of more blood. I think across the board, man. I want to see people bust out razor blades like Dr. Wagner Jr. Start, did and start cutting themselves the right crap. in front of the camera. You absolutely. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. I love all those, all those uh, uh, ruthless aggression era matches where people are just bleeding all over the place. I'm totally in, uh, in favor of that. Um, you know, you know what could use. I, I would say this though. So, like, I, I mentioned the mania thing, but I think more than anything, matches. So, uh, for example, I know it was a high profile match, but it wasn't the highest profile match. Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Bret Hart. Yeah, that was a match where the blood really added. It, for to, a good example, actually, Becky Lynch in the Build a Survivor Series last year. Yeah, yeah. The blood after she got clocked by Nia Jax really amplified the image. So if you use it in a match that's not the main event, because the, whatever the main event in the women's division is already going to be a big spotlight match, 
you use it further down the card. Yeah. So like, for example, Bailey versus Ember Moon, that's a match that isn't going to be like main eventing the women's divisions. Uh, it's going to be the Raw Women's Championship. Mm -hmm. But if you add the blood to that, like seeing Bailey bleed, that'd be crazy. Yeah, that'd be that would be something completely unexpected. I was thinking of uh, well, Natalia and that tables match where somebody was it Ruby Riot mm -hmm. was it Riot Squad. Mm -hmm. Natalia versus Ruby Riot. That match, if that had blood in it, that could have amplified things. It could have been yeah. like, whoa, do you see? You know, yeah, whatever happened it was crazy. But did you see that match? Yeah. Then you're making stars because of the drama that everybody witnessed. Yeah. So like you're saying. If it's used sparingly, it can it can really really heighten the drama. Yep. Uh, however, I generally think more is better. More is better when and it comes more to but blood. better. Exactly. Uh, next, got a question from Matt Chat Hall of Famer Ao Worm. What's going, on, everybody? It's your boy Ao Worm here, back with another Matt Chat question. Okay, Steve Larson. Quick question: Who's your favorite ref in all of wrestling? Like to me personally, right now, my favorite ref is Red Shoes because I could probably not like two wrestlers. And if I see red shoes in the match, I would immediately be into the match itself. So who's your guy's favorite ref in wrestling right now? All right, guys, take it easy. Too sweet, hearty handshake. Thank you, A.O. Worm. Thank you, A.O. Worm. Uh, you I go, go first. first. Oh, man, give me. So, yes, A.O. Worm, red shoes, Yeah, that's iconic. the right answer. That's iconic. the correct answer. However. He had so much to a match, man. However, give me. You know, you know he doesn't add nearly as much to the matches as the refs do in AAA. Let's talk about that a little bit, Larson. First up, you've got NWO Guy Fieri. Yeah. You've got who's, who's I think, the sleepyhead, right? He's the slow count ref. No, no, no. He's the guy that replaced the slow count ref in the main event. Right. Oh, yeah. He replaced Rocky's brother, Paulie. Yes. Right? Yes. So He was a slow count ref. He was a slow count napping ref. Yeah. But then you got NWO Guy Fieri. I think he was down the middle. Yeah, he was. But then you've got fast count ref. Who is literally like the fastest counter I've ever seen and in my he's entire jacked life. Jacked, and he's got a sick drop kick. He's got an amazing drop kick. He is jacked, and he helps the wrestlers when they need help to execute these high flying moves, which we all want to see. I want to see a ref who gives the crowd what they want to see. I don't like slow counts. I love fast counts. If you can't, can't get your shoulder up after like two and a quarter, then you should be done. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So give me fast count ref from AAA. That's the man. Nobody adds more to a match literally than fast count ref. He is the story. Fast count ref was my runner up, but I don't think the referee should be the story of the match. Oh, in AAA. That's why, that's why Red Shoes is the absolute best in the business. He adds so much. To the story being told. You know why the fast ring. count ref so is better? Much. Because those wrestlers know they have to compete with him. Ah. And so that's why they nobody sells there. There's no there's no rest anything. Mm -mm. They just get right back up because they know that the more time spent down on the mat is more time fast count ref is hogging up camera time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why. Uh, Red Shoes is the best, man. He's got personality, but doesn't overshine it, outshine anybody else. Yeah. Uh, he His reactions to things adds the story in the ring. When two people are down, he's like, hey, one of you cover the other one. Like, yeah. he encourages wrestlers to do things. Yeah, I like it's that. It's great. I like that. It is. Um, he's so damn good. Red Shoes is really good. Plus, of course, he's the father of Shooter. Anyways, moving on. Uh, apparently, we've been pronounce, pronounce, uh, mispronouncing Wang's name incorrectly. Yeah, it's not Wang. It's Wong. Yeah. Unfortunately for Wong, I'm going to continue to refer to him as Wang because that's how I met him. That's what I know of him. All right. My mispronunciation. So here's Wang Choco. Greeting friendos, this is the non-news intro Mark Wang Choco coming at you with the first Matt Chat question. Uh, I'm really excited, it's the first time doing this. Uh, but I really enjoyed watching Triple Mania with you guys on Saturday. It was an amazing show. Uh, just pure pandemonium, no idea what was going on, but it was really fun to kind of uh, experience it with you and the rest of the friendos. So I was wondering if there was one theme that you could bring from AAA to WWE, what would it be? Uh, for me, it would be maybe the unabashed just swearing, just pure, just no one cared and just swore and swore and swore. And I thought that was pretty great. Um, either that or the IP violations through all of the uh, music that was being used. Uh, that was pretty funny, too. But let me know what you guys think. What would you bring over from AAA to WWE to make it just a bit more fun? Uh, it doesn't have to be realistic. Just make it fun. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, too sweet, hearty handshake. And you guys all have a great one. Bye. Thank you, Wong. I hope Wong didn't literally join the Matt Chat tier just to let us know how his name is actually pronounced. Either. I hope not either. If he did, bad move on his part because it's Wang. Wong. 
Uh, you got it right as far as one thing Triple A. I want to see WWE. I want to see more heel refs. Fast count ref, yeah. Yeah, heel refs. Like uh, uh, Nick Patrick, uh, underappreciated part of uh, WCW. Are you just saying that you don't want refs to be part of the story? This is WWE. I care about that less. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 fast count ref, obviously. Uh, most recently, Brad Maddox is heel ref. <laughs> Mad Braddox, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, that was all right, I guess. Yeah. Um, Refs that need to come out the next episode and explain themselves. Yeah, that's really what. I'm Like, talking. imagine uh, Drake, Drake works, Drake yeah, Younger. Sure. Yeah, comes at come has to explain his actions and he goes heel on. on I people. bet he's got a crazy drop kick. Yeah. Oh man, he's 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 got a lot of crazy crazy a lot of things. I feel yeah, like he's man. an accomplished wrestler in his own right. CZW guy. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so love to see that. Also, when the time is right, when the feud is right, when the story demands it, a hammer. Let's see your hammer. Oh, I got put away. What? I didn't do it. Oh, put I did it because I was hammering stuff. Oh, you were worried I was going to clock you with it all not, not Blue backs, Demon though. Jr. I don't know, man. I don't think you have that in you. I don't think so, huh? <laughs> you've seen, you've seen uh, so. anger in my eyes before, apparently. Uh, yeah, I know, but I don't know if it's wheel to hammer anger. I, I think it's just fisticuffs anger. You're too old-timey for that, man. Um, so anyways, yeah, hammers is good. That's a good one. I'm going to say um, also I like uh, mixed tag titles. Yeah. Um, like get rid of legit, one of that's actually it'd be really good. Yeah, get rid of either SmackDown or Raw tag title for the men, just <laughs> unify and then introduce because mixed match challenge. Which, by the way, when is that coming back? Um, yeah, who knows? That is. was so much fun. Uh, I'd love to see some titles for that. I think it'd be great. They could defend them on main event. I watched main event this week. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Dana Brooke versus uh, oh Sarah Logan. I'll get to that in a little bit. Here. Okay. Okay. Fair uh, enough. Next up, we've got. One, two, three. Fair Thabata. Let's see what he has to say. Should John Cena's next WrestleMania storyline be for the 24-7 championship? And if so, how should that play out? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Fair Thabata. Um, you go first, I believe. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Listen, here's the deal. Uh, you obviously don't want Cena actively trying to get the 24-7 title. He is far above that. However... Uh, given that John Cena seems to be on like full-time part-timer status and he might even be inching towards Undertaker schedule, uh, he might actually be at Undertaker schedule at this point. I feel like Undertaker's going to have more matches this year. I think you're probably right. No, I think you're probably right about that. Um, So I think that's where John Cena is now. Maybe there's another WrestleMania where he attends as a fan like we saw two years ago. Uh, Maybe he does that, and maybe the 24-7 scrum comes near him he ends up with hot dog in hand, obtaining the 24-7 title, and then somehow comedically losing it. I think he'd get a kick out of that. The people would get a kick out of that. No harm done. Uh, and then in a couple years after that, he'd go after his number 17. What World title or bust, man. You think so? Yeah, man. I think it won't do anybody any harm if John Cena picks up the 24-7 Sure, title. it won't do any harm, but I, uh, for him, world title or bust. Yeah, all right. Because whenever someone else has a world title and, and, he, and he, he confronts them, he always says, that belongs to me, <laughs> right? I don't see him stepping up to Drake Maverick and saying, that belongs to me. No, I, that's why I said you sh- he should not go for it. Okay. He should just inadvertently get it. Stumble into because it. Because how great would that list of champions be? And suddenly John Cena like appears. Titus O'Neil, Drake Maverick, R-Truth, Mike Canellis, Marie Canellis, Mike Patterson, Canellis, Pat Patterson, Gerald, Gerald Briscoe, Briscoe Candice Kelly Michelle, Kelly Kelly, Kelly Alundra Blaze. Uh, million dollar man, uh, the Drake, and then yeah, the Drake, yeah, <laughs> and then there John Cena, yeah. you know. Next, new Next. Matt Chatter, yes, Walk yes. with Joe, yes. Hey guys, first time Matt Chat question from Walk with Joe. Um, down at the river, with my kids, and our question is: put together a card for a showcase type pay per view where. WWE only showcases talent not being used. Give me some matches. Give me some thoughts. Let's see what you got. All right, too sweet. <laughs> Hearty handshake, of course. Thank you, Walk with Joe. And welcome to Matt Chat Walk with Joe. You're welcome. And the too sweet and kid in the background. Anyway. All right, this is my show. Yeah. For the WWE title. What is it you, called, man? I don't even think of a name. What? I didn't think of a name. Give me, you're a creative dude. Think one on the spot. You're on the clock now. Steal your name. Oh, no. No. I'll call it uh, the penultimate main event. How about that? God damn it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, for the universal WWE title, whatever is considered top title, Cedric Alexander versus Mustafa Ali. Okay. 
Good. Hell of a match. Uh, Bob Roode versus... I feel like you're kind of cheating there. I'm pretty sure Cedric and Ollie are probably going to be at SummerSlam in matches. It's not, they're not, they haven't been announced so far. Okay, fair enough. They're not as, as, as they're not used as well or as often as they Your should be. Your next match should be for a title, uh, for a twenty four seven title. Bob Roode versus EC three, okay. and that really should be the top title on this particular M- match. Show. The rules are suspended for this match. As soon as yeah, the bell of course, rings, of course. Then. Yes, yes, we know. Uh, Apollo Cruz versus Buddy Murphy for the Intercontinental title. See, that's a good. That's a really good match. I mean, Buddy Murphy could start being but Buddy Murphy might well be in utilized a summer starting slam today. Match, yeah, <clears throat> uh, uh, Harper versus Rusev. Oh, I like that. That's good. And then finally, Dana Brooke versus Liv Morgan. Okay, I like all that. That's really good. So, yes, mine is called the ultimate main event. Of course, now I'm a big fan of WWE main event. Uh, they had Sam Roberts on again. He's an integral part of uh, Dana Brooke. commentary Brooke's. team there? Yeah. Oh, he, it, or Dana's storyline. Yeah, because he, he claims that all of Dana Brooke's improvements have been because of his criticisms. It's pretty funny. <laughs> It's good. It's actually pretty good stuff. When you know these guys don't give a crap and they're yeah. just there to have fun, yeah. it, it really does make it fun. Uh, let's see here. So mine is called the ultimate main event. And the main event of the ultimate main event is just that. Dana Brooke versus Sarah Logan. Whoa. Women's division main eventing ultimate main event. The pay-per-view. Crazy. Uh, of course, I'm only using titles that are. Well, I'm not going to say underutilized, but that would be appropriate for this show. Mm-hmm. The 24-7 title is, is overutilized, really. Uh, so, in that uh, spirit of things, uh, the second ever 24-7 scramble, and it's going to be intergender, uh, I have Carmella going over Good. there. Good. Uh, after that, we have uh, EC3 versus Apollo Crews in a body guy match. Good. Don't know what that is, but I like the sound of it. Yeah. And then finally, uh, Titus O'Neil versus Eric Young from We Book Raw. So the love doctor, Eric The love Young. doctor, provocateur, auteur. Yeah. Eric Young. Exactly. Good. Uh, I got a few uh, text questions here. First from Jack Spencer. He asks, uh, which independent promotion do you think produces the best weekly television internet show? Uh, Jack has recently started watching MLW on a weekly basis and probably find it the most enjoyable indie show to watch. He still watches Impact Ring of Honor. However, lately I feel like both uh, shows have suffered for different reasons. I should hear your answers. Too sweet and stay awesome. Thank you, Jack. So MLW is really good. Um, they have a really wonderful roster. Uh, didn't, didn't did Cal have a match there? No, he just wrestled uh, f- filthy Tom, L- dirty Tom Lawler. Was it filthy Tom Lawler? Filthy Tom. Lawler. Yeah, up in Oregon. <laughs> I forget the adjective. Um, but that wasn't for MLW. No, it, was no, a, it no, wasn't. He okay. For, okay. Up in Oregon but Lawler, I think, is like their champion. Or was. was their champion? Who's was. their champion now? Uh, Fatu, Jacob Fatu. Oh, good for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so MLW is a lot of fun, uh, and they had a shanking in it. Mm-hmm. Um, That's correct. Yeah, but uh, I'm going to say my answer is championship wrestling from Hollywood, and it's for one main. Number one, they have some really terrific talent there, uh, but uh, one of the reasons is because it's shot in like an old-school TV studio type setting, like, I swear there's only a crowd on one side of things. Oh, it's like they did in the old days. I think, yeah, it feels like a TV studio. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, if it's not, then I'm tripping, but it really feels like that. The, the setup seems like that. Um, so it just has, like, an old school feel. Um, I've seen some of the people wrestling there. They'll show up as, like, local enhancement whenever uh, WWE goes to SoCal. Uh, and so that's really neat. Um, but, yeah, I'll say a championship wrestling from Hollywood. Um, I'll go with Beyond Wrestling. They have their Uncharted Territory show. I believe it's weekly. I haven't watched as much of it as I would like. Um, and they culminate in, in, in their own kind of major shows. They just had the one a couple weeks back. The main event was David Starr versus Joey Janela in a 60-minute Iron Man match that looked absolutely insane. Oh, too much, man. Um, hurts just thinking about it. It's one company I really need to, to, uh, to, to watch a lot more of their stuff. I believe, I think, they're like the l- most subscribed to independent wrestling YouTube channel. Like their over stuff subs. looks beautiful. Yeah. Their stuff really looks yeah. good. Um, I know. My, one of my favorite things, like, because I'm old, I don't really do a whole lot on the weekends. But if I happen to be home on a Saturday night, uh, one of my favorite things, everybody goes to bed, and I'm just either on my iPad drawing or whatever, I'll pop on some random ass wrestling, you know, show, some stuff that I've never heard of, something I need to, I, I want to familiar. I just love watching random ass wrestling stuff. It's my favorite. Next. Hadley Doodley Champ says, this week's question come from uh, fast ba- Fat Bastard Champ Alex Foster. Question is, if Baron Corbin became president, what laws would Baron pass to help build C- Baron's character in wrestling? Uh, first thing he would do is issue an executive order to ban roll-ups. Mm-hmm. 
No more roll-ups. Yeah. Um, uh, in wrestling, at least in WWE wrestling, because mm-hmm. as we all know, that is Baron's weakness. Second, can you do as Baron Corbin the presidential oath? I solemnly Hold swear. On. You got you to swear on. Well, I can't read it from there. That's the issue. Please, please put your hand on this. Put your other hand up. <laughs> okay. Well, then, can you put that one on this hand on this Bible here? Okay, that's good. That just stay where you are there. Okay. Uh, Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I solemnly swear do. That I will faithfully execute that. That. I. Baron. Will. Will. Faithfully. Faith. Full E. Yeah. Execute. Execute. <laughs> the office of the president of the United States. The office president states. Good enough. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of Baron's ability. Preserve. Preserve. Protect. Human skulls. <laughs> no, you, oh, God. Protect. Protect. And defend. Defend. The Constitution of the United States. Baron Corbin, slow wolf pack. <laughs> Thank you, Baron. You're welcome. So what laws would he enact? What Ban the roll up. And then he would institute uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of, of, not institute, he would uh, push through Congress. And sign some sort of law that would allow uh, people to it actually make be, money off their Twitter opinions. It would all be executive orders. Yeah, totally. And yes, he would do that because he would have all the money if he did that. I'm going to say he uh, he would institute tax incentives for buying Ferraris yeah. so he could finally get his own Ferrari instead of renting it and getting called out by Billy Gunn on Twitter. Uh, and then, of course, there would be no limits. I'm sure some states have to have limits on human skull I buying. Think. You would think that collecting human skulls wouldn't be... Legal in some states. Yeah, I don't know, man. There are some bizarre laws out there. I would think that that's not a bizarre one. You should not really be yeah, allowed to collect like, human skulls. You wouldn't think so, no. Watch this Unsolved Mysteries the other day where this lady found out that her uh, her house was on an old cemetery that uh, was primarily uh, for slaves back in the day. And uh, she like dug up the remains in order to, or they had already dug up the remains because they were told there were bodies back there. And then she uh, went to give them a proper burial and, uh, and put flowers and stuff and all this nice stuff. And those ghosts started messing with her. She was like, I just tried to do something nice for you. And they were like, mm, they, yeah, it was like the first time I've ever actually seen somebody died from ghost. So like she went and she was going to dig them up again because like her life was a nightmare. And then uh, she started to feel ill. And so her daughter came over and started to help. And, uh, and like the lady went inside, but her daughter was like 30 years old. And then she fell ill, had a heart attack and died the next day. Oh my gosh. I like in all my time, I've never heard of ghosts actually killing somebody, Mm-mm. but these ghosts straight up killed somebody. Wow. Crazy, right? That's crazy. Luis Areza has a text question. What are commentary cliches you guys hate? I think this is kind of first really done by Jerry Lawler. Most famously. Yeah, it's when it's when the heel commentator gets lecherous. You're not a fan of Don Callis in New Japan? <laughs> he can be kind of lecherous Yeah, sometimes. he can. Even Corey bit. Graves is now. Especially when anytime Mandy Rose pops up on the TV. I wouldn't call that lecherous. I wouldn't say it's lecherous. It's approaching it. Oh, man, I don't know. There's a difference between, like... Jerry Lawler literally admitting that he had an erection on air. I understand that. Like talking about boobs and stuff. Or Corey just sort of genuflex, you know? It's a little bit more than just genuflection, though. I don't know. Yeah, I kind of feel like he's teetering on the line of of, of, of maybe on occasion slipping into being tasteless. The line might be up ahead. It might be the next exit. We can agree on that. Yeah, some tasteless (laughs) comment. Uh, Yeah. The the potential exists that might happen. Yeah. He might. He might. Be on the on the verge of overstepping the line, but I, I have faith that Corey Graves is not going to overstep that line. I would I, I would like to hope so. Yeah, he seems like a, a, a smart guy. Basically, but so you you're not huge into heel announcers or into announcers sort of expressing uh, lust. <laughs> yeah, no, not into it. Mm-mm. More often, I mean, it, it, I I assume at least in Corey's situation, he does it to try to be kind of funny. Yeah, sure, but it, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's awkward. It doesn't bug me that much because him and Renee have such a high school brother and sister mm-hmm. sort of relationship that I think he does it mainly to play off her. 
Um, he's, I mean, yeah, he's not nearly as bad as, as Lawler. You oh, mentioned Don Callis. Close, come close. No. But it's 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 a, a trope of the heel announcer post Lawler that seems sure, to okay. stuck around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether the degree is the same, it's a trope, a cliche. I'm kind of over. He's uh, with with Mandy though. He's kind of he's sort of selling. I mean, she's you know her character is obviously an overly sexualized character. And he's selling that aspect of I understand the character. That. I understand that. So I don't know. I kind of I I feel what you're coming from with this. I agree with you. Uh, I think Graves is in is in safe territory. I'm going to say this though: the heel commentator always aligning with heels. That's something that Corey doesn't always do, and that's something that I love about him. He calls out heels and they go too far, especially in NXT when no matter what Elias did, he was anti Elias. Mm-hmm. I always loved that because that was a Heenan thing. Heenan would always, he would have like what Heenan always hated Hogan regardless of what Hogan was doing. Yeah. Uh and and even when Hogan was like healing it up, Heenan was anti Hogan. Yeah. And I always appreciated that. Uh so I like when and I think Nigel's like the perfect heel commentator because he's kind of heelish. He just likes to sort of poke fun at the good guys. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like. I don't like when they get overbearing. Like the worst heel commentator on the planet Earth ever of all time. Michael Cole. Was heel Michael Cole. Yeah. Oh, boy, that was horrible. It was awful. That was awful. Yeah, that was worse. Anyways, if you want to be part of Matt Chat, by all means, you can. Just go to the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Stephen Larson. It's $20 reward tier. Uh, that's for the month. You get Matt Chat. You get the Friendo Care Package. Get all sorts of great rewards yeah. and uh, bonus content. So check it out if you're there. We also have lower reward tiers. And uh, thanks so much for watching. We appreciate it. And join us for SummerSlam later on today. Yeah. Till next time, we'll talk to you later. Bye.